it is only in the darkness that we see stars. Um, so I uh, emphasize on this practice and be open to your growth mindset. Um, learn, unlearn, relearn. Uh, that's my way forward. And be open to change. So let us not have any fixed mindset and let us be open to change because we are going to see a lot, lot more changes in the coming days. Welcome to another episode of the People Home interview series. I'm your host Vanessa and let's begin with a quick introduction of People Home. People Home is an end-to-end one-view integrated human capital management automation platform. The winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for 8pm that is specifically built for crafted employee experiences and the future of work. We run the People Home blog and the video channel which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest, Sundar Viswanathan is an executive, business and leadership coach, mentor, facilitator and professional speaker at Solopreneur. His corporate expertise includes delivering results, performance transformation, change management and creating a happy organization. He's a seasoned leader with 35 years of professional corporate experience. We are extremely happy and honored to have him on our interview series today. Welcome Sundar, we are thrilled to have you. Thank you so much, it's my pleasure. Thank you for this opportunity, Vanessa. It's and thank pleasure. you to People Hum. Yeah. So, Sundar, can you, could you tell us a little bit about your journey that has brought you to being a leadership coach? Yeah, yeah thank you for asking that, uh, Vanessa. So, um, way back in 1981, I um, did my honors in mechanical engineering from College of Engineering, Hindi, which is now 226 years old college, one of the oldest colleges, I suppose, in this uh, part of the world. Um, so then, um, like a typical mechanical engineer, I joined uh, a manufacturing organization. Um, and uh, I was on the shop floor as well for about uh, clear four and a half years. Um, so I could pick up the initial threads of how to work in an organization and things like that. But I still remember that um, after, uh, I think, one year of my experience in uh, um, the company, uh, um, I could see there are lots of issues on the shop floor where people who are involved in the day-to-day -day operations, because they could not understand the products and the components and things like that, there are lots of mix-ups and hence uh, there was a delay in production. So after the factory hours in the day shift at times, I used to take uh, classes for uh, people um, to know the components and the importance of the components, identification of the components, and then how they can perform better on the shop floor. So that was way back in, I think, uh, 1982. Uh, so then um, with that experience, I had an excellent leader, I should say, at that point of time. Uh, um, um, even though those days, um, most of the leadership was actually directional, um, I had the opportunity and the blessings of a uh, right leader in my very first job. And he was there to guide me and um, uh, I could learn and pick up the threads of uh, how to be performing in a manufacturing organization setup. So during that four and a half uh, years, I uh, qualified myself with uh, additional qualifications in um, postgraduate diploma in business and industrial management, postgraduate diploma in export management and advanced uh, computer management. And um, I shifted my role from being in production planning and control and industrial engineering um, to systems engineering. So I will, I'm actually proud to say that I was uh, instrumental in bringing the first ever PC to my company at the time. Um, and um, I also learned um, um, uh, at the time it's called uh, uh, Excel word processor, uh, so many other things. So we did the training in the basics of how to operate the computer and then we moved forward. Um, and because of these uh, additional qualifications, I could get into uh, one of the most reputed management consulting firms at those times, AIF Ferguson and Company. I'd like to mention the name of the company. And um, uh, I was the first um, so called engineer uh, with these qualifications to be recruited in a management consulting firm. And uh, if I am here in this position today, 
I would uh, attribute that to my experience in A. Ferguson um, because uh, in a span of about uh, six years, I would have done about 90 plus assignments covering almost all functional areas of management and different business verticals. And I had the best leaders to support me and guide me <laughs> during those times. And uh, the most important uh, skill I picked up there is that uh, I can get into any business or any function and quickly pick up the threats to move forward. Because I think one of the most important traits for management consulting. Um, so then we, I moved on. So I had a, the opportunity of working with so many leaders at the time. I had made one presentation to Lucy Modi of Tata Steel at the time. Um, uh, I fondly remember those days because you people used to even shiver in, to stand in front of him because he's such a noble person, highly qualified person uh, in terms of his performance. But at the same time, it's so down to earth. But going and standing in front of him, making a presentation, we need guts. So not not that he's going to say anything, but we did. Uh, that was one of my proud moments at the time. So then I moved on. So uh, at the time, I think uh, um, that was uh, 1991, 1992. Um, um, so the IT industry was actually in the in uh, booming, and uh, I shifted my focus from, from management consulting to IT industry. So I served a few companies on, in the IT industry. So I became a country head um, um, in one of the companies. Um, then I was um, um, in charge of uh, global, um, I mean, all India operations uh, in one company. Um, then I got into management services, HR, uh, subsequently. Um, then um, I also was um, um, on uh, the advisor kind of a role to a management director, managing director of another company. That's where uh, my shift started uh, to the uh, C and D level. Um, so that was after, uh, what do I say? So about uh, 25 years of experience, I got into this opportunity to see C, C and D level. Um, so I got the opportunity to work for TVS and Sons as a CIO. And um, um, that was my first opportunity in the C level. Um, uh, that was a good seven years uh, of my uh, experience and um, I'm happy to say that uh, I brought in the first ever ERP into TVS and Sons and I had a team of at the time about 50 people um, and um, I could bring in a change to those people on how to showing up, how to show up on a daily basis in a corporate culture. Um, uh, and I had a marketing person in my team to market the IT services and the ERP to about the 3,000, 3,500 people in TVS and Sons across India. Um, and they used to run weekly, um, what do I say, um, uh, events to promote IT within the organization. Um, and, um, but it is not that uh, that was a completely a rosy path. I had my own share of failures. I, I could not go live on time uh, for a couple of times of the year, year of implementation. So uh, those things did happen. Uh, but at the same time, um, uh, I would, I'm also happy to say that uh, I got um, CIO 100 awards uh, three times uh, during my tenure. And I got um, um, the best retail CIO award um, from Dhananda Street. Um, and also, I won an award for yearly adaptation of a technology from Microsoft. Um, so then I um, moved forward. So uh, from IT, I got into business. Um, uh, that in TVS and Sons, IT was in the uh, automotive um, business areas. So now I got into one of the largest Toyota dealerships in Chennai. So I was uh, heading them as a COO, reporting to the promoters of the dealership and um, was managing about close to 1,000 crores of uh, revenue and about 1,500 people uh, to be managed. And, um, and I'm also again proud to say that uh, during that tenure, we won the most coveted Triple Crown Award from Toyota. And uh, we got about the one crore plus award for the company. And um, all the three years dealerships uh, won that uh, award uh, that year. And it was phenomenal. And um, one of the biggest dealerships in our group itself also won the best customer relationship award. So these are my milestones and um, 
moments to cherish to when I look back uh, from today. Um, so then I had to take a break because of my personal reasons and um, I, I, I um, attended to my personal uh, um, requirements and then I got back uh, uh, to the corporate world as um, in a startup. Um, uh, it's a totally different kind of uh, experience. Uh, as a director for uh, a company who moved from Hong Kong to set up shop in India, um, that was a combination of IT and automotive. Uh, so that's where my strengths were drawn into, do the complete business strategy, business plan, go to market strategy, high level requirements, portal designs and things like that. Um, so then as a luck would have it, then I also did a market study. The pointers were that uh, we should launch the portal, not in the place where I live in. So I could not move because of my personal reasons. So I had to say bye to them. And then uh, I joined a group uh, who are uh, into manufacturing. So if you can see that I moved from IT to business, uh, to a startup and to uh, a group CEO in a manufacturing company. And the reason why I'm saying this is uh, all this was possible because of my experience way back, way back in management consulting. Otherwise, this wouldn't have been possible. Um, and um, so I was, uh, I served for a short period in um, the group as a group CEO. And um, again, I had to take a break for my personal reasons. And um, then um, uh, I had to attend on my mother as well. And she passed away after a few months. And that is one of the reasons why I wanted to be at home with my mother. Um, then uh, after that uh, phase was over, I was thinking on what I should do, uh, whether to get back to the corporate world or do something different. So that's where I did my um, research and um, I decided to reinvent myself after the 35 years of corporate experience. Um, I decided to pursue a journey in coaching um, so then uh, I did my certification uh, from Ericsson Coaching International and that was uh, yearly 2018. So actually I reinvented myself in end 2017. Um, so then I started my coaching journey. Um, uh, then actually you see unconsciously um, in the corporate world without the tag of a mentor, uh, uh, we get to mentor so many people. And now looking back, when they are in a very good position and they're also winning the CIO 100 awards. So I'm so happy to see that I could uh, add some value to them somewhere in their life's journey. Um, so then I decided to wear uh, the hat of a mentor as well in addition to the coach. Um, and um, then uh, as a complementary to this coaching, uh, where we facilitate the clients to un uncover their own hidden potential I thought facilitation will also be a good idea. So I enrolled myself with International Association of Facilitators. So I decided, I started working on facilitation as well. And professional speaking also attracted me. So I got into that area also. So now um, coaching, uh, mentoring, facilitation, and professional speaking, these are four things I do. And in coaching, I chose uh, executive leadership coaching as my niche area because um, of my prior experience in the corporate world, I thought I can make a positive impact and a positive difference in people's um, life journey. So I am, I will be, a, I, actually I'm thrilled to partner with uh, so many of my clients uh, in their life journey and um, um, and playing the role of a catalyst. Um, and um, I'm so happy at the end of the day today when I look back, um, these two years plus of, uh, coaching, mentoring, facilitating, and professional speaking has given me quite a lot of fulfillment uh, to my life. And uh, I'm happy to see the happy faces of my clients. And um, that's where I am today. And that's how my journey led into uh, coaching and these other three areas. And that's how I chose my leadership coaching at Venice area as well. Yeah, I think that's such an exciting journey. You've worked across so many industries and you have so many achievements in your stride. It's amazing. Thank you, Anisha. And it's interesting how you spoke about leaders you had at every phase in your life. So now yeah. you're just paying it forward, right? Absolutely, that's right. See, at the end of the day, one has to always give back to the community. Um, uh, in whatever way it is uh, possible for us, and whatever way that uh, brings in some satisfaction and happiness to us, 
as well. So it is actually the balancing of both sides. It is not only that the revenue that matters, it is also that satisfaction you derive by being of uh, help and support to somebody in their life journey. So that also, I think, uh, is a major point to consider. Very so true. So Sundar, this is a this is a very hard time for leaders worldwide, you know, with the pandemic and remote working. Yeah. So how would you advise leaders of today to lead with empathy while not losing losing sight of their business goal? It's a very difficult time for everybody around the world, and uh, yeah, even though the two um, downsides that we have seen in 2008 and one in the way to pay aside at times and all, uh, this is totally different. I think it's a uh, it has been. It has taken people by uh, total surprise and uh, uh, totally the uh, humanity was derailed. And um, there are a few champions who have been uh, uh, leading the way in terms of making us to come out of this pandemic. So having acknowledged the, the crisis which we are going through now, um, I think um, um, it has become uh, very clear in these uh, pandemics that uh, people are the key. Um, so, whether the organization is big, small, or um, um, whatever be the size of the organization, people matter the most. Uh, so, having said that, um, those managers and the leaders um, um, also understood um, um, that communicating the people in the best possible manner and being transparent to them and um, giving uh, giving their uh, space to listen to their um, frustrations, anxiety, and giving them uh, that feeling of security, safety, all these things mattered most. Mm -hmm. And those leaders who would have done or who are still doing um, uh, these things by giving space to the people, asking for feedback, being vulnerable, and uh, even after asking for feedback, putting them into action as soon as possible because uh, these times, I think, the faster the action is more, the, is better. Um, so those will be the leaders who are uh, going to be looked upon in the days to come. And um, um, as uh, any difficult situation has it, uh, there would have uh, been many leaders who would have emerged by this time. Um, and um, those leaders who could not empathize and put themselves in the people's shoes, um, are not going to be the leaders in the days to come. Um, because everybody are watching um, uh, everybody else. Um, so those who are empathetic um, with the people and who take them along um, are going to be the leaders for tomorrow. Uh, so having said that, um, um, when the pandemic started and we got to the peak of it, I think um, the focus of most of the leaders in the world uh, was on only on people. Um, and that's why they leveraged um, uh, so many virtual platforms who also chipped in with um, uh, so much of um, features um, to connect uh, uh, people together uh, in their respective companies, uh, keep them engaged on various activities. Uh, um, they, many, I know many companies gave space for people to vent out their feelings um, uh, because working from home is not all that rosy. It is going, it's, a, it's a such a difficult uh, uh, task of working from home. Um, so people got adjusted to that. So um, uh, people acknowledge at the same time when you are asking uh, this question of without losing sight of the business goals, I think that started coming in at a little later part. That's what I could see. So initially people were focusing on the uh, leaders were focusing on people and then they shifted slowly to um, um, how to look at the business goals, business uh, strategies, business plans by taking the people along into decision making. I think that, that would have been the crux of most of the organizations if they are going to be successful in the days to come. So they, um, because of the uh, uh, continuous transparent communication, the leaders made sure that uh, people in the team, in the organization understood what the company is going through and um, um, what they are trying to do for the people, uh, what is the safety and security measures taken for the people, uh, and what is that they should do in return. I have come across companies where uh, the team members went to the leaders and managers asking for what is that we can do for you. So uh, uh, that is the best side of the humanity. So when once people understand 
what you are doing for them and they are there and ready to help you in taking the business forward. Um, so the business community plans, um, I think many companies have put it together, but still it is not all that clear on how the future is going to be. Um, so these leaders who have taken the people along with them uh, by being empathetic and uh, addressing the people's issues, involving them in the decision making and redoing the plans, I think are the leaders and the organizations who are going to succeed in the days to come. That's so being transparent and empathizing is what will you know, matter most now. And it's not just employees that are watching, but customers are watching brands too. Absolutely. Uh, leadership has been, uh, in my view, so far has been directional. Um, it has, has been only one day, one way where the managers used to tell the team members on what to do, how to do and things like that. And the people uh, went about and doing it in that way. And uh, once um, you see the concept of the millennials, uh, Gen Z, and uh, things like that. I think people aligned their leadership styles or the managerial styles in such a way that uh, um, they started listening to people. Um, they started taking their views and harvest the wisdom of the team in uh, taking decisions. And uh, that's what it has been doing. So what has been happening was we were having a lot of authoritative leadership. So from authoritative leadership, we have moved or moving into a sort of facilitative or participative leadership. So that's what the shift is happening now. Um, so it was earlier uh, uh, a method of controlling. So um, now we are moving towards what is called influencing. So uh, influencing is a big word because where you influence people to do the work. And um, as a leader, I support the team members in executing the work, not in getting the work done. So there's a lot of uh, shift in the way the leaders look at uh, um, the leadership in these days. So that's one of the big evolutions of leadership in the recent times. Yeah. So similar from your experience, how do you think leadership has evolved over the years? Yeah, thank you for asking that uh, good question, uh, Vanessa. Um, so leadership has evolved over a period of time in all spheres of life. Um, so having said that, um, uh, but there have been exceptions uh, throughout. Um, that have, there have been excellent leaders uh, throughout in all spheres of life. And um, predominantly in the organizational context, I think um, initially the leadership was more directional. Um, uh, so then uh, things have started moving from being directional, being authoritative leadership to more of a facilitative leadership or more of a participative leadership. That's what uh, the change has happened uh, the past uh, so many years. Um, um, having said that, um, we are now moving from um, controlling to more of empowering um, or influencing. So, so we are influencing people now to do the work instead of um, controlling, uh, saying that um, uh, if the results are fed back into the loop to assess whether you have done correctly or not and things like that. Instead of that, we by the yeah, leadership style of being uh, influencing people, I think we help uh, people to do the job in the most suitable way for the organization. Um, at the same time, I think uh, uh, initially it was only the leader who will be talking in the meeting or the manager who will be talking in the meeting most of the members will be generally silent. And because it's only one, one way, one way, right? It's only one direction. Uh, but now I think that the leaders and managers are more aware that um, they have to solicit the views of the participants in the meeting as well. So that means um, uh, we are moving towards um, uh, a culture of harvesting wisdom of the participants and not only go by what we know. Because I, I think uh, it's, um, it's very clear that uh, it is not that everybody knows everything. So that's why we need a team, right? So um, uh, even if uh, I am um, um, uh, I am in, uh, let's say, in a CEO role, I may not know everything about the sales and marketing. I may not know everything about technology. So I may have experts in the respective roles to do that. So it is about how to get people along, influencing them to do, deliver the best results. I think that's where the leadership side has uh, shifted. and. Um, Micromanaging is going away. So I think that is also happening or happened in these pandemic times. Um, so where uh, working from home, if the manager is more micromanaging, it will be 
uh, doing more or you could have done more harm than uh, facilitating people to deliver their best i think by giving people the space empowering them to do what they are supposed to do i think it's one of the best ways in which the leadership is evolving in uh, these days once uh, once yeah that's a very interesting thing you said you know managing moving from controlling to empowering which is very powerful So people are more opinionated now, and it's time for employers to acknowledge them. Right. So Sundar, uh, also highly engaged cultures attract the best talent, and have the lowest voluntary turnover rates, and are more profitable in the long run. So where should you think business leaders start from to create a differentiated culture? Yeah, actually, um, the culture is a uh, one of the most important. things that uh, set organizations apart that's a very excellent question uh, uh, manasha so having said that so when did we start um, with a differentiated culture so i think uh, uh, in my view it is right from the word go uh, mm-hmm. i think now i think um, uh, all the leaders are more aware about the importance of culture so i think it is also better to uh, in my view oh, culture is something what we practice day in and day out um, um it is um, uh, it also stands up uh, it also defines our value system and what are the ethics we follow and we set as a leaders an example for others to emulate and follow uh, i think that's what culture is all about so having said that i think it is right from the beginning we have to do that and many companies have used this pandemic to reset and redefine their uh, culture um Uh, as uh, i was as you were also introducing me in the early uh, earlier in the conversation i am always for setting up for uh, creating a happy organization that's what i always uh, used to work for and that used to be one of my visions in many of the organizations setting up a happy organization so that means what so what happiness means to me is that um, uh, people uh, the entire ecosystem the organization they are happy to do what they are supposed to do and um, they should not feel uh, every day morning that oh my god i have to go to go to work today instead they feel uh, motivated uh, themselves uh, to come for work and do their work so instead of so less of follow up and more of uh, delivery and execution um so then the leaders have to define themselves um what type of culture they want whether it is a performance culture or it is a um, 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 any other type of culture they want there are only basic ingredients that go along with that so more focus on people so people who are into culture at the end of the day when we say about business or an organization people or business business or organization are in a um, stage because they are want to they want to make a difference to the society and to themselves that's why they are in the business so having said that i think there is no specific uh, answer of when they should start defining the culture for me it is right from the word go and um, uh, this is one of the areas um, where the leaders have to think when they step into an organization or when they are starting an organization what type of culture i will have sometimes what happens is uh, the culture also evolves over a period of time so that culture evolving is based primarily because of what values and standards each of the leaders follow and that gets converted into a culture yeah so culture is inbuilt it's not something you know you decide you want to start one day right except in uh, some ways where um, um in one of my experiences what i have seen is um, um the culture of the organization was very directional when i stepped in uh, i had to reorient it and then say that we will uh, have a performance and reward culture so that is that was my first step in taking that uh, reorientation so when i say that then i have to communicate to the people saying that whatever has happened has happened but now moving forward this is what we will do and this is what the policies and the uh, procedures will be and uh, then i start showing up in that way on a daily basis so if i become a people oriented uh, culture people centered organization then i the small things like i start wishing people on the birthdays um start putting up a, 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 on the notice board about the wedding day celebrations and the milestone which they have achieved so uh, select some uh, somebody as um, employee for the month 
and uh, when you get together with the employees make the employee of the month to say a few words so then you demonstrate it by an example uh, and then the culture gets reoriented yeah, so it's important to find a balance between people oriented or you know business -oriented. performance yeah that's right what about startup leaders racing towards the finish line what advice would you give them for operational focus yeah that's an interesting question because i do work with uh, many entrepreneurs uh, as a coach and a mentor um, i do that um, uh, i i remember a classic uh, proverb here so uh, which you which it goes like this so when you want to walk fast go alone when you want to walk far walk together um, so my advice is uh, i think um, startups uh, come into existence because they have an idea um, to address a particular need or a want of the community and um, the startups uh, on the entrepreneurs have to really look into whether they are addressing a real existing problem of the community of the people and uh, whether the solution makes sense to the people they can test it out and then see that that's a real issue to be addressed then take on from there and then uh, i always suggest that uh, entrepreneurs have um, a clear plan of action in place um, when i say a clear plan of action that's not only about the financial portions but also caring about uh, sales marketing um, as well as operations as well as the strategic focus so um, um, before you plunge into the market you do, uh, you need to have a strategy and a plan of action in place and uh, when i was saying earlier so you need to have a team in place i think uh, it is a team which makes all the difference you may not be able to do everything in in an entrepreneurial entrepreneurial ecosystem so you need support so you may not be an expert in everything so you need people like, uh, having expertise in certain areas so take so those few people along with you with a clear understanding and transparent communication of what is the expectations from the team and then take it forward um so while doing that one step at a time uh, you move forward by not to do fo losing focus on anything actually you are not supposed to look for focus not only on operational but strategic issues but also on the uh, financial uh, aspects when i say financial aspects certainly cash flows and also the sales and marketing aspects and what your competitors are doing uh, what is the difference they are bringing to the table and what you can do differently to retain your market share or increase your market share and then with a clear plan of action take it forward right and speaking about change now is there anything that is lying ahead that you feel is scary as well as exciting in terms of workplace and the people and the culture yeah scary in the sense uh, um i'm really uh, keen that we should not repeat uh, which the humanity uh, made a mistake in 1918 when the spanish flu um, came up again as a second wave and uh, a lot of people lost their lives um, so that is a scary portion for me so hopefully this coronavirus pandemic i think uh, all of us in the world take appropriate care so that the second wave do not hit us and uh, uh, we learn to live with the virus in the way forward so that is a scary portion for me but um, i'm sure many things out there in the market are going to get redefined um, uh, i call this as a next normal uh, mm -hmm. the reason is um, there will be so many changes which will happen and change is the only constant i think all of us know that so when i say that uh, i could see um, that um, um, there is going to be a mixture of or a balancing between work from home and uh, going physically to the work space because we need to uh, take care of the social distancing aspects as well as the hygiene factor um, at the same time i think traveling is not going to be that much uh, in, in early prior to the covid time so <clears throat> that sector is going to get redefined and uh, many businesses may take place uh, virtually business conversations may take place virtually and there are many virtual platforms have chipped in to support uh, this kind of a demand in the future and um, um, i think uh, the workplace itself is going to get redefined and the financial structure the cost structure are going to get redefined um, the partnerships um, out there in the market 
geographically as well as uh, locally is going to get redefined. Um, people will find a new set of customers. They may come out with a new set of ideas on the um, new set of requirements which are coming up in the market. A lot of creativity, creativity and innovation are going to take place. I think it's already taking place. It will get their life and shape in the days to come. So um, new businesses will come up. And um, I'm looking at it positively because if something goes, something will come up. So if one door closes, some other door will certainly open. And um, um, maybe the travel industry, hospitality industry may take a hit, but I think there also people are um, um, repurposing the organization and they are uh, reinventing on how they can do better. I was reading somewhere that um, virtual tourism and the virtual uh, travel is going to take place. So you may visit few places physically, but uh, you may like to um, pay and uh, experience virtual traveling, the places which you would like to see, the museums which you would like to see, and uh, things like that. So that's going to be a totally a, a different kind of uh, experience for all of us. So technology is going to play a major role. I think um, um, in uh, even the hospital industry, even though there's a technology now, even more artificial intelligence and robotics will come in place. Um, so technology will find a major share now uh, moving forward. But I think we are, we are still not able to predict this exactly what will happen. I think we'll have to wait and see and how things will shape up in each of the industry segments um, and how the new base of uh, moving forward in the business gets defined. Nice, but also positive. It really is the new normal, and it only yeah. depends on how fast we adapt to it. So, Sundar, do you have any last sound bites you'd like to leave our audience with? Yeah, um, I uh, want to suggest that um, uh, as a leader, uh, one should be more aware of self. Uh, so, that means the self leadership is very, very important. Uh, and that's otherwise, that we need ourselves first, we cannot lead others. Uh, so, having said that, uh, there are um, um, uh, few of points which I would like to uh, mention that um, many I, during the webinars which I have taken during this uh, lockdown period, uh, I have always been suggesting to people that it is a time for them to introspect themselves, look at the blind spots, do a SWOT analysis for them. It is not a, it, a SWOT analysis may look like a jargon, but it is very simple. You have to only identify your strengths, areas for improvements, what opportunities you have, what threats you have and how will you overcome them. So this is what you are supposed to do. So identify your blind spots, identify the areas which will, or which have been derailing you and um, try to work on them and um, try to become more resilient um, uh, uh, by understanding your emotions, um, recognizing the emotions and the feelings which you have um, and then taking a pause before responding and stop reacting. So that is one thing I want to see, I want to tell the, the people. And um, uh, I learned it from uh, the last two years of my coaching. So it is always uh, um, nice to allocate some time for yourself, let's say five minutes, 10 minutes for yourself on a daily basis. Uh, this is, I call it as a me time. Um, so where you, self-reflect on what you have done in the previous day. If you're doing it at the end of the day, at the beginning of each day, what is that you have done in the previous day? What did you do well in the previous day? What are the challenges you have faced in the previous day? And what you could have done differently in the last day? And also start journaling it. And over a period of time, this journal will become such a big reference point for you, so for you to improve further and take forward. And um, it is only in the darkness that we see stars. So having said that, so even though we went through this lockdown, or we are still going through the lockdown, we are getting the unlock one phase. Um, I think um, many people would have found more about themselves. And uh, please keep working on that. Keep working on bettering yourself on a daily basis so that you show up well on an everyday basis, both to your family as well as to the people outside. So showing up means how you make people around you feel about yourself or feel about them. Or you're giving the positive vibes to people. So it's very easy to say, but it, is, it comes by practice. Um, so I uh, uh, emphasize on this practice and be open to your growth mindset. Um, 
learn, unlearn, relearn. Uh, that's my way forward. And be open to change. So let us not have any fixed mindset and let us be open to change because we are going to see a lot, of, lot more changes in the coming days. That's what I would like to leave people with. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's a good time for self analysis, both personally and professionally. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Sundar, for that. I had a great time talking to you. I really appreciate you sharing your time and your views with us. And, and I'm sure our audience is going to love this video. Thank you so much, Manisha, for the opportunity. Thank you so much for your time to discuss and have this conversation with me. Um, uh, I wish um, you, uh, people hum, people at people hum, and also all the people who are looking at this video, all the very best in the days to come. Take care. Wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you.